Last time, we wrote some code that took the product of a whole bunch of numbers using an executor service. We were demonstrating the use of Java Util Concurrent. We want to continue playing with this. We want to look at performance a little bit. And we also want to write another version that uses Scala futures. And that's the looking at performance is going to lead us to a discussion of something called Amdahl's Law, which relates to how much you can improve the uh, performance of a piece of code by parallelizing it. So this is the code that we had. I've actually made some simplifications to the timing code. And I made it so that our timing runs are going to use 100 runs, which causes them to go a little bit slower. Maybe I could make it 50. But it causes these numbers to be a bit more stable. Uh, there's still variation. If I were to run this again, you wouldn't see the 0.41 or 041. Uh, we'll see something a little bit different. Yeah, 040. They're all pretty close to 0.04 for the code that we wrote, whereas the normal library is a lot closer to 0.01. It's about four times faster. And so that's something we need to figure out. Now, one thing that is a factor here is we're only using four threads, and we'll, whereas the built-in library is using more. So we'll explore that in just a bit. Uh, first, I actually want to simplify this code right here. Um, this is fine using for loop with a var, but there is a part of it that makes me feel unhappy. And I want to show that we can do this just as well using a range. So we're just using the range. And what I'm going to do now, I don't want, we need to map it across nums, but I don't want to build a whole new collection. So I'm going to say dot view and then take the product of that. So I'm going to use basically the built-in product method instead of doing that. And we can run this just to make sure that we get roughly the same type of performance. We're looking for 0 0.04 as our rough estimate here. Yep, there we go. Okay, that looks about the same. So with that in place, I'm actually going to remove the code that we had previously because this is a lot shorter. Now I want to rewrite this. In fact, how about we just copy it? And I'm going to make another version that is going to use Scala futures. So I'm going to call it parallel product SF. So instead of submitting to an executor service, we're just going to build a future here. And we need to import our futures. In order to be able to launch a future, we need to have Scala concurrent execution context. We need some form of execution context, and we're just going to go with the general global one. OK. Uh, <clears throat> we no longer have a call in here. You'll note this is actually a much shorter version than especially what we had before. Uh, it's shorter even than this. Now, once again, starting with Scala 2.12, instead of building a new callable and putting a call method inside of it, I could use a Lambda expression. Um, uh, it's just the Eclipse that I have installed here is still using Scala 2.11, and that won't work under 2.11. This is where things get interesting. Okay, I have my futures, and right now futures is a sequence of future, so I need it to become a future of sequence. So we'll call sequence on it. And then when I map that, I should get out the mapping on this should give me the contents of it, which would just be a sequence of big ints. And I should be able to take the, uh, the product of that sequence of big ints. Now, if you look at the error message here, it says found a future of big ints and needs a big int. The proper way to do this in a Scala, in Scala code, if we weren't trying to time it, would be to make the return value be a future. Okay, this would be the right way to do this in a larger program, but we want to time it. And, well, we can actually put in that code real quick, see what happens. <clears throat> so I put in a call to time our new version here we should get a 0 0.04. Oh my goodness, look at that. That's so remarkably fast. Well, the problem is this code right now 
isn't actually waiting to finish the calculation. So what we're timing is how fast can it produce the futures, not how fast can it do the calculation. If I want to actually be able to time it using this timing code without having to modify it and do something with four reaches to, to find when it stops, I'm going to have to do something that we really don't like to do, and that is I'm going to have to call await. So we can await on the result, and I'm going to let it wait for up to one second. In order for that one second to work, I need to import Scala.concurrent.duration. Okay, and now we no longer need the future wrapped around this up here. It's just giving us back a big int. And what is this value of seconds? plural. Did I not put, oh, I didn't put a dot underscore. There we go. Okay, so now if we run this code, we shouldn't get that really tiny number saying that it went really, 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 really fast. And indeed, we don't. We get something that's very much like our other version of the code. So 0.04 followed by probably some small number. Every so often I get a run that's under 0.04, but that's about where we stand. So these two versions are roughly equal performance. Uh, they're both using the same number of threads, and we can actually make them run a little bit faster by reducing the number of threads, or by increasing the number of threads. But you notice that it's still not as good as the library function. Even if I go up to like 16 here, so those were 0.02 somethings. If I go up to 16 threads, that didn't help. In fact, it looks like it hurt. Okay, it looks like somewhere around 8 was our was our fastest run. But even with the 8, it's still several times slower than our the built-in libraries. So what are the built-in libraries doing that we're not here? Well, um, to understand what's going on, it actually helps to look at this thing called Amdahl's Law. So Amdahl's law is a measure of how much improvement you can get from parallelism. We have these constants P and N. So P is the fraction of the code that can be done in parallel. Because every time you write code, you didn't stick all of it in something that runs in parallel. You generally have some aspects that are sequential. Okay? And so um, P is how much of it turned to parallel. One over P is how much of it was still sequential. So we get this one over p here that's basically sequential code, and then the p part can be divided by n, which is the number of processors that we have uh, running, or the number of cores, the number of threads, we're breaking it up. And this is kind of assuming an ideal breakup here. That if, if we have 10 threads, we're all always using 10 threads. This would be the maximum performance improvement that you can expect. Well, that means that if p is small, you actually, you're stuck with a, a pretty bad speed up here. In fact, as n goes to infinity, assume we had a machine with an infinite number of cores, this term drops to zero, and our speed up is completely dominated by what fraction is sequential. So with that in mind, let's go back and let's look at our code here. So we have a whole bunch of stuff that's happening in parallel there or there, but the last line in this is taking a product and it's doing it in a completely sequential way. Now, calling dot par would allow it to be parallel, but that's kind of cheating. That's what we could have. That's what we just did for the whole thing down here. Breaking this up further and having those last multiplication. You might, and this is only multiplying eight numbers. Why does it matter? Because by that point, they're eight very large numbers. And how long it takes to multiply big ints grows as the big ints get larger. So there's actually a fair bit of work going on here. We can actually illustrate this by I'm going to cheat. One of the things about our timing code is our timing code doesn't actually verify we got the right answer. All it does is uh, all it does is make sure you know give us the timing result. And so I can do a similar thing here instead of taking the product, I can just say I'm going to wait for that for one seconds. Actually, there is a second. I just didn't have the underscore there. And then, of course, I do have to give back 
a big int. So now these two things actually do, because I'm calling get here, because I have the await here, they're actually doing all the parallel calculation. They're making our, in this case, eight separate products inside of the array, but then they're not bothering to multiply them together at the end. So we've basically made it so all of this is now more parallel. And if we run this, we see that they're actually getting closer. And in fact, if I go up to 16, it's possible we might get another level of speed up. Indeed, there you go. Okay, so when I go to 16 threads with these, they actually beat this out. Of course, they didn't do all the work. That's, that's part of why they can win. So the reason why the dot par is beating us out is because we do not have, our p fraction is not as close to one as we'd like it to be. We would love it if everything in the entire code could be parallel, in which case this term would win and our speed up could actually be proportional to the number of threads that we're using. That's not the actual situation here. Uh, we have some stuff that's happening sequentially and that caps how much of a performance gain we can get from parallelizing our code right now.